So, so what, what is, is the squat? squat? Why it? So, as, as Kuhn stated, stated, generally the first movement you're going to do in the meet, it's basically you're targeting uh, lower body dominant, dominant groups, groups such, such as the quad, posterior chain for a little, little bit of stability and loading. Um, I'll, I'll demonstrate, demonstrate a little bit while Coach Kuhn walks through a little bit. Through 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 little bit. Through so, through so, so uh, uh, first thing, thing I should note, is, is that, that we usually unrack the bar facing the rack instead of facing out, right, just for safety. safety. So, so when, when you put the bar back, back you can actually see the hooks where, where you, uh, where you, where you, where you rack, rack it back. back. So, so first, first off, we're doing, doing the other way around. It's fine. Why it's going to unrack the bar? Before, before you unrack the bar, notice that he already took a big breath and already stabilized his core. This is what we call bracing. We're going to go over that in a little bit. So first thing why he's trying to do is get as much upper body tension as he can. So, so he's, he's going to grip, grip the bar, bar very rigidly, then, then he's, he's going to try and engage his lats. lats. So, so almost like doing a lat pull down with the bar on the back. back. Of, of course, course the bar's, bar's not going to bend, bend be really, really pretty strong, strong. It could, but, but you, you want to engage those lats, lats by pulling down, down getting, getting as much, much stability and tension through the trunk as possible. Second thing he's going to do is going to find his foot positioning. So why is this very experienced squatter, he knows where to set his feet. This might be something you have to look into. Come, Come back, back to that, that later. He, he found, found his foot position. position. First, First thing he's, he's going to do is, is retake, retake that big breath, breath try and get as much intra-abdominal tension. Then he's, he's going to sit back, back and bend, bend the knees at the same time, time going, going into a squat, squat coming out. out. Very, Very nice. nice. See, he still kept, kept his brace entire, entire, through the entire motion. motion. He did, he did not, not breathe out on the way up. He did not breathe out on the way down. He kept it nice and stable. So can you go down one more time, Wedge? Look at the depth. Uh, in, in the, the squat, squat that Wyatt is hitting. So, so he's, he's going, going pretty, pretty low. low. What we're generally looking for is hips, hips lower than knee. He can come back up. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, right back. back. So, so this is why we usually use the rack. rack. Uh, <laughs> look at the camera on the screen. screen. <laughs> this, this is why we usually unrack the bar facing the rack. So just, just like you saw, you can rack it easier. Why? A few little key points with squat. See a lot of new people mess this up very consistently, and it's not, not the most, most exciting, exciting thing to work on, but really the two mechanics, mechanics that are going to make or break your squat in the beginning are going to be creating a proper brace and then also something we call rooting. So when we're bracing, we're trying to build intra-abdominal pressure while we also keep our ribcage and our pelvis in neutral alignment. What that means, without that scientific jargon there, uh, we're trying to create a very stacked, compressed, uh, stable, stable trunk, trunk and core, right? right? Because <coughs> we're only as strong as we are stable. I might, I might have, have this leg strength to squat 300 kilos, but if my back, back is a paper clip, clip it's not going to go too well. well. Can you so so maybe uh, demonstrate with the bar in your back, back show improper pelvic position, position and improper. So you, so you see a lot of the newbies, newbies uh, when, they when they come out, they walk out, you'll see this generic behavior that they believe if I take this giant gulp of air, I'm going to have, have the best brace in the world, and then they get stapled by a squat that they should be able to hit quite easily. Who will we'll talk you through why that is. is. All right, so, so why is going, going to unrack the bar again? again. Take, Take it on his back. back. Can you walk, walk out, out maybe go sideways to the camera, camera so you can see your side angle? So, so first, yeah, it should be about right. First, first show proper alignment. So I'm just going to show the wrong stuff. Okay, okay, show, show the wrong stuff first. 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 Uh, posterior hip tilt. tilt. Too, Too much. much. Uh, we'll, we'll go, go through, through a couple of different keys, keys and faults that you've seen a lot of newly lifters. lifters. So, so one, one of these being uh, pelvic tilt. tilt. It's kind, kind of a general, general term, meaning that, that you have a bias uh, towards, towards improper, improper spine alignment. alignment. That, that can, can be flaring of the rib cage. We call that a duck squat. Or you can also come in and overcorrect. Both extremes are not ideal for this movement. Exactly. So, so what, what we do want, want you can see why pretty well on right? Uh, we, we want, want that, that big brace. brace. So if, if we look, look at his pelvis, it's, it's pretty much uh, perpendicular to the floor, floor. same as his ribs, so it's all pointing pretty, pretty much the same way. If you would uh, lift up his, his rib cage now, it'd be up, right? So we don't have that like box kind of anymore. So we want to keep those rib cages down, we want to keep the pelvis nice and tucked. Breathe into this, not into this. This is already supported by your rib cage. We want to fill this with air, get as stable as possible, and then make a squat. Don't make a squat now that you're elbow. Um, but that is what we want. So one more time, we don't want to stand like this. We don't want to stand like this. We want to stand nice and neutral. Or tight, big breath, go down. That's the most important part, I think, of the squat. So again, it's... Two very key major points that a lot of people overlook because they think, oh, that doesn't make that big of a difference. But I mean, uh, if you think about it, right, you want stacked compressed abdominals. How can you achieve a stacked 
properly tension the muscle if it's in an extension. Uh, quick news, you can't. That's why if you see the squats like this, you shrug, you'll see the people get this. Oh, big, big air, big air, air. Yeah, yeah, I've got, got big air, air. I'm going to do, do well, I'm going to do, do well. They come down here, and then they accordion squat. squat. And they get stapled, stapled to the floor, or they, they make, make a very, very easy weight, much more difficult than it should be. Um, it's a very, very simple mechanic, often overlooked. Second one we were going to talk about, rooting. Uh, again, it seems very simple. It's really just about creating proper force translation from the floor by basing yourself with proper balance and engagement of the foot and ankle. Right? So, so going, going back, back to what, what we said, said you're only as strong as you are stable. stable. I, can I can load 300 kilos on Kuhn's back, back, but if he's, he's on rollerblades and he's wiggling all over the place, do you think he's, he's going to be able to get, get that squat done? No, sir. Probably not. So when we say by rooting, typically you'll hear a term used a lot for introductory uh, discussions of this movement. You're this thing called a tripod foot, right? You have a pinky toe, big toe, heel. You want to keep three points of contact on this, and you want to try to keep even pressure throughout the foot. It's not really the easiest thing to see with this camera angle, but uh, we'll try to be descriptive in the nature of it. So uh, proper foot engagement is something that kind of got to get used to, especially if you're going to squat heels. And uh, we have a couple different ways that we cue that. One that I use for Kuhn, uh, I tell him to spread the floor. So you want to get lateral engagement, which is going to keep your adductors primed and your adductors engaged as well. So when we do that, we're going to keep three points of contact on the foot. We're going to try to spread the floor. Not necessarily rotate with the knee or rotate with the hip, because in this movement, you need mobility of the ankle, you need stability in the knee, and again, mobility in the hip. So when we're saying cue lateral tension in the floor, we're going to keep our three points of contact and spread. And when we do that, we're going to engage all of this grouping. Your posterior chain, I promise you, it's going to be a lot easier to squat that weight if you're engaging your quad and your posterior chain. You're using way more muscle. So I'll show you what happens if I stand normally. First, let's see, good camera angle. Uh, if I stand normally versus when I start rooting, let's see, this is about right. right. So, okay. Do supinated, pronated. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so look, look at my ankles mainly. Maybe the uh, angle of my knees as well. This is me just relaxing, right? You can see that my ankles are kind of inside. They're, they're falling a little bit. Now, I start rooting. I'm grabbing the floor. I'm trying to spread it. I'm not rotating my knees. This is all my foot. See how my ankles are more stacked? I'm trying to create three points of contact. One, one with the ball of my big toe, and my pinky, and my heel. And then, and then I, I can initiate a nice and stable, and stable squat. squat. Right. I see a lot of the times uh, knee valves are relaxed versus rooting. Knee valves is a very uh, common <laughs> fault. You'll see a lot of beginning <laughs> power lifters because they'll jump in the knee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the uh, knee wiggle. You're going to do the same knee. Um, you'll see this a lot of time in beginning power lifters because without learning how to squat properly, you jump in squat shoes. Get mad at me for saying it, but it's true. I was, I was guilty, guilty of this, this too, by the way. It's fine. It's, it's really easy, easy to fix. Uh, you message us at any time. We can walk you through it. But basically, you'll see inter, you'll see pronated or supinated collapse of that foot because you don't know how to keep even foot pressure. Again, we're only as strong as we are stable. And if my knees are like this, that's not really the optimal way to drive through the force, right? I can drive through my quad all in one, but at that point, I'm just going to look like I'm doing a stanky leg. Not really ideal for finishing a third attempt squat. Pretty much. All right. Uh, I, think I think we can, can go through the squat, squat one more time. Um, and five yeah, yeah, go through what, what you're thinking, thinking about when you're trying to squat. Well, well you, you walk through it. You know. hmm? I don't need to tell you. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're fine. So, so why it's wrecking wreck the bar? And I'm just, just going to go step by step of why you want to do certain things in the squat, right? Uh, okay, okay, unwreck the bar. Take a breath. Nice and braced. Of course, it's lighter weight. It's not going to look as impressive, but it's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, step, step out, out a little bit. So, okay. When, when we are going to squat, some of you may have never squatted. squatted. Is, Is there, there anyone put in chat if you've never performed a squat in the gym, gym uh, actually? Uh, that's that's one, one, me. Ah, oh, oh, okay, okay Rishi, I see you. <laughs> funny guy. Funny guy. Rishi is very strong. Um, if, if you've never squatted, we're just going to go from zero to a couple points, points right? So, First thing, bar placement. This is called a high bar squat. Perfectly fine to begin with. It's awesome uh, for both quads and everything. Um, so like we said, we want to find a position with our hands on the bar that is comfortable for our shoulders and elbows. That's where it pretty much starts. If you don't have a comfortable position with the hands, all right, with the hands, uh, you're not going to be able to squat comfortably. Your squat's going to look messy. It's not going to feel nice, right? 
So, so first, first thing, by finding our uh, hand alignment on the box, it's just playing around, see what feels comfortable, um, and, and kind of check what is uh, less pain is. If you're a smaller person, usually you can grab the bar a bit closer. If you're a bit more muscular, spacing your hands out a little bit might feel more comfortable. Also, look at Wyatt's hands. He's got what we call the claw grip. So one thing he's under, it's for nicer shoulder, uh, Sorry, English is hard. Nice shoulder mobility, mobility, so it doesn't hurt your bench a lot, and you're too lazy to stretch. Mm -hmm. uh, it's well, you're stretching these days, days but uh, yeah, we're getting, you're just getting, getting stronger than you're stretching, you know? That's it. Anyway, back, back to the squat. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so, so find, find a position that's comfortable for you. I usually recommend starting with the uh, index finger on the ring and starting from there, toying around, which, 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 which uh, for wow, English, with, with, which, which is more comfortable. So. Uh, next thing, we, we kind, kind of want to stack our shoulder blades a little bit. We don't want to be here in the squat. So you can see why pulling down and also back a little bit to create a platform for the bar to lay on. Because if the bar starts rolling, you're done, right? We don't want that. No, it's not a weightlifting bar. It's actually a road bar. Uh -huh. I'm answering some uh, questions in your um, face. So from the back, can you see? Yeah, yeah kind of. I don't, I don't want, want to be here with the bar on my back. I kind of want to pull back and in. That's how I engage my lats. Lats, by the way, for some of you that don't know, is latissimus dorsi. It's a big muscle that goes over the back, pulls your arm down, you using pull ups and everything. That's why lat pull down is called lat pull down. Uh, latissimus dorsi, pull down pretty much. Right, so it's nice and stacked. Turn around again. Yep. All right, awesome. So. Um, can, can you, you find, find a sideways angle, angle again? again? One, One more time. Sorry. Sorry. Sideways, sideways, not back. back. Yep. yep. Awesome. All right. We're, We're going to go down. We just went through the shoulders. We're going down. Tell, Tell me if it gets uncomfortable. Let's go for it. All right. So, um, I, I want Wyatt to show a correct squat. squat. So, so creating tension, tension with the breath, breath sitting down. down. Notice how his hips and knees move simultaneously. Come on, Wyatt. This, this was, was with neutral, neutral spine, right? right? The, the stuff, stuff we wanted, we just talked talk about, about the bracing and uh, everything. Can, can you show us now uh, how hard it is to hit also depth when, when you over uh, extend your pelvic? pelvic? This, this is called uh, open scissor. This is what we see almost all of the noobs do, or the gen generic gym goers. So you'll, you'll see, see them come, come they'll look at the rack, rack they'll come in, get all hyped up for their uh, squat attempt, attempt at the knee, and they'll go, and then they'll completely throw out all the tension that they built in their abdominals, and they'll get this extension here, rib cage flex. And then they'll go down, and because you're biasing the backside of your hip so much, you're creating less room for your quad and your hip flexors to actually properly fire. So you're going to come in, and you're going to have this tilt, and then you're going to hit here, and you're going to get stuck. Yeah. And then you're going to come up, and then, well, I did that way too. You're going <laughs> to more often than not, you'll see them do the, the ribcage flare, come down, and then, and then they'll, they'll yeah, 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 yeah. have, have the slinky effect. effect. So, so stand, stay, stay there, there if you want, stay there if you want. Uh, uh, find find the position, position again. again. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So, so if, if you uh, tilt, tilt the pelvic again extremely, what happens as well, the hamstrings, right, the muscle on the back of the leg, is attached underneath the glute to the hip. If I pull my hips back, kind of, I get, I get more stretch, stretch on my hamstrings, hamstrings making, making it almost impossible for me to hit depth, depth in the bottom because my hamstrings, hamstrings just not allowing my hip to go back, back anymore. So I can't, can't see, it's all, it's all stretched, stretched up here. You've got, got no room to, to lower, so you're not, not hitting depth, depth which, which is what we want, want in a competition, competition because otherwise we're, we're out, out of the competition. So, so one, one more time, with a nice neutral spine, sitting down in the hole, boom, hit depth, come up. Very nice, Katie, you can rack it. Awesome. What, what is, is a good cue to create a neutral spine? Um, there is a couple. Uh, why did you take the lead on this? Again, as, as you interact, interact with the coach, if you're new, I recommend reaching out. out. Isaac Stark has a couple of the pretty knowledgeable people that are more than willing to help you out with their free time. What I like to do is a cue called draw down. If you know me at all, I am a kabuki. Boy, through and through, <laughs> through. Kabuki, Kabuki strength, strength is my training and pretty much my whole ideology. I speak them like they're gospel. And they use a cue called draw down. down. So, so when Kuhn is lined up under the bar, artificially create yeah, rack, right? So he's got his hand position. 
He's, He's got, got his, his upper, upper back, back tension. tension. Before, Before any of my athletes come out from the bar, I make, make you squat it like it's 500 kilos. kilos. I tell I you, you to stand up with it like your life depends on it, on it right? right? Why, Why do we, we want, want to do that? that? Back, back to stability. stability. If, if I've, I've got, got proper tension in all my muscles when I stand up, when I do my walkout, my life is going to be that much easier. And to do that, Kuhn especially, if you know him, he's a strong guy. I hate his squat. He's got one thing that he does that really irritates me. And Kuhn, when he likes to walk out his weight, he will take a big breath and completely throw his ribs out of alignment. He'll do that little open can that we talked about. I get him back, though, but I start off wrong. It doesn't matter. This is true. So what I like to cue him when we're doing our training sessions, when he's lining up before he gets ready to step up with the weight, I'll cue him. So, 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 so think, think of the, 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 the lid and the bottom of the can, can as your pelvic and your rib, right? Uh, oh, why is my just died? It's fine. So, so why is trying to say, um, actually, we've got a nice little painting over here. I hope you can see it. Well, painting, it's a drawing, pretty much. Yeah, yeah I can, can bring it closer. closer. Okay. I, think, I, think, I think it's too heavy, heavy, man. man. <laughs> Get, Get out, out of the light, light for a quick second. second. So, uh, you, you want to think, think of your... your uh, pelvic, pelvic and your ribs, ribs as these lines, right? And this, this is your spine. This is what we want in the squat and the deadlift, pretty much. Um, this, this is what wa, this is what, mm, it's not here. This is what wa, I just demonstrated, hips too much back, chest too much up, can't hit depth, can't get the brace, can't get tension, you'll fail pretty much. This is what we want. So what I was saying, I got the bar over here, it's good and yeah, so I take that small little breath out. You see that I kind of contract my abdominals and everything, right? Like, like you're almost bracing for a quick little punch, punch. Nothing, nothing to like, like put you in the hospital. So I'm standing and I'm, <laughs> next thing I do is I retake that big breath, but I try and keep the tension I just created with that air out. So I'm going to, again, again. <laughs> notice that I'm neutral again. I'm not compressed anymore. I'm neutral again. So, <laughs> and you can squat. And then, and then try and think of your body and your hips as one whole. There is no moving, moving, moving part in your hips, right? This doesn't happen. If you stand, you stay like this. All that happens is your whole body with your hips moves as a whole block, right? So you're not trying to wiggle, you move as a block. So one more time. Uh, try and practice good mornings, maybe. So all this moves as a block. See my hips and my little back stay the same position throughout the whole range, which is what we want, and then we can squat down. Right? So none of this, and also none of this. Which actually happens sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah? Um, if you're having a hard time still holding that neutral spine, ask more questions if you like, though, please. Uh, if you're having a hard time still doing this, just try and think of some smashing in the stomach. You're going to brace automatically. Keep that brace. Go. It's, it's less efficient, efficient of course, um, but that's it, it, it works for beginners, beginners right? right? That's yeah. semantics. At this, At this point, point, just get, get the proper movement patterns down, down and you will progress. Pretty, pretty much. much. I, think I think we're ready, ready to, to go to bench. bench. It's been 20, 20 minutes. minutes. It'll take 20, 20 minutes for a lift or so. Let's get out of the way. And we'll set, set up the bench, bench press. Uh, uh, yeah, that's fine. fine. Yeah. yeah. I, I can, can bench, bench too. Well, that's what doesn't matter. Not no, bad. Well, uh, 60 is maybe a bit, bit heavy, heavy, no? <laughs> Probably. To me, yes, it is. Hmm? Oh, yeah. yeah. Good, Good question. question. Let, Let us know in the chat, chat how, much how much you can lift, lift and maybe as well how much you would like to be able to lift. Maybe we can help. We'll see. We'll know. Oh, tell, tell them how, how much we lift. lift. Oh, I got, I got some uh, noisy commenters on the side here. They, they want, want me to tell, tell me tell you how much I lift. They want you to brag a little bit. How much do you lift, Quinton? No, no, no. I'm getting there. No, no, no. I don't, I don't lift, lift enough either. either. No, uh, my, my squat's, squat's like 310. 
My, my oh, Rishi's 135. 135. Oh! Rishi's trash talking. Well, my squat is 310, my bench press is like 190, and my uh, deadlift is 325. Which are gym lifts, so they don't count yet. They're gym lifts. Why? How much you lift? The same! I have not gone lower! <laughs> nah, uh, my dad is higher. My it doesn't matter. matter. I don't do IPF, so I don't really. No, I did 190 in the gym, Fokker. I did 190 in the gym. Touching No, I was positive. I have the video. video. I have the video. Okay. Okay. How, How much did you lift again? Go. Uh, I had the high knee. I did 295 squat. Bungled my third squat. Sad. Best bench is 185, deadlift 300. I see Larissa in the chat squatting 157 and at benching 95. Deadlifting 162, that's actually kind of insane. Yeah, that's very strong. Wow, she's going to be benching already. Yeah, oh, there's some might have benched me eventually. Before we move on, does anybody have more questions for the squat? Or are just kind of nonchalantly moving through? Yeah. Please ask away. Hmm? Yeah, okay, true. It's fine. You got some way to go there, buddy. Working on it. Oh, that's okay. okay. That just oh, means no. you got a great bench press. True. Oh, um, and you're struggling a bit more on deadlift, but it doesn't, doesn't show it. Like 162 is still very nice. nice. Awesome. Um, um, and anyways, bench press, press. Let's, let's do it. it. So, so I, think I think the camera's, camera's zoomed in, in now. now. No, no, you, you can, can still see me. That's nice. nice. Awesome. Oh, uh, there's the zoom. Ah, I think I did enough. Are they marrying me? I had to be done. I had to be done. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it had to be done. done. It's, it's fine. fine. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, so, bench press. I'm just going to go on my knees. Um, so, first thing in the bench press, we're just going to go from zero to 100 again. Show all the steps. Where do you sit on the bench? Let's start there. Depends on the person. Depends on the length of the person. I usually start in the front of the bench. Why it's a bit in the middle now? Which, Which is fine, fine. he's short. Your I'm alignment's going to really depend on how tall you are. Um, more or less, when you start a lift, if you have a spotter, you want to kind of have your eyes aligned in line with the bar. So to say, here, what it means, you want to be able to look at it or maybe a little bit in front of it. Yeah. yeah. Position on the bench is completely relative. Uh, wouldn't say it matters too much. Uh, you just need to be able to have that position, position uh, where, where you're, you're lining up such that your eyes are in line with the bar. bar. So, so that, that way, whenever, whenever you're getting a lift off, your shoulders can stay in an advantageous position as we come down, right? We don't want to be, you know, 15 centimeters in front of the bar and then being lifted off like this. Yeah, that messes up your start, and also you're never going to be able to get into a decent start at the first point. So we don't want too far of a distance between yourself and the bar. Uh, so, so what, what you just said, like eyes alignment, alignment is a generally good rule. So when you lay down on the bench, you want to look straight up, and the bar is in the same line as your eyes, right? That's about about right for most people. Again, not everybody is most people, so find what you prefer the most. But too much distance is not good. I see you in the chat, so you don't want to squat off for you. Emil, get out of those sleeves quickly, man. Come on. Hey, listen, buddy. Emil needs to get his squat up. Oh, true. Maybe Emil needs to sleeve size off something. That might be the thing. Oh, that's fine. That's okay. <laughs> He's, He's doing, doing well. well. He's doing so, well. secondly, you see why you're jiggling around on that bench a little bit. Can you tell us what you're doing there? Right, so I'm a very picky boy. And you'll, sir, you've seen a, a lot of the memes about powerlifters setting up for bench. Uh, basically, what we're trying to do, again, we're trying to harness as much of the strength in our shoulder girdle, back, and chest as we can because we want the highest bench that we can. Now, what I'm doing, finding position on the bench, is uh, I'm creating tension in my upper back. Now, a lot of people mistreat this uh, in the bench press. So your shoulder is a very complex joint. And we've had this argument many times. Can you walk them through retraction and compression? So retraction first is basically pulling the shoulder blades back. So with the extended arm, which is, of course, the bench press position, you're taking the shoulder back. Right across, across the shoulder girdle. The depression means down. So, so this, this is a combination of retraction and depression, right? Um, which, which is what most people will tell you to do. Now, there, the, 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 the discussion that Wyatt is referring to is do we want only uh, retraction or do we want retraction and depression? Or do we want some degree of motion or ability to rotate in the shoulder girdle? I'm too tall, I know, it's fine. They can still hear me. 
and they, they can, can see you, which is good. Um, so, so basically, basically uh, where, where did, did we leave? So, uh, <laughs> where you're, you're going to set up on the bench, bench you're going to find, find your hand position. position. Again, this, this is something that's, that's going to be unique to each lifter. We're not going to tell you which way right or wrong to do it. Over time, as you develop a feeling for the lift, then you become experienced with your own body mechanics. Uh, you're going to determine how close or wide or uh, narrow your grip is going to be. Can't really put that one on a book label. There are plenty of people that bench however they want and do quite fine with it. Um, once you have that alignment for your eye position and head position, and you have your hand placement on the bar, you're going to try to create this shoulder depression. Okay, so, so in, in a, a really oversimplified example, uh, the reason we don't want to do shoulder retraction in the bench, bench press is it's, it's going to put our pec minor and major in an elongated state at a mechanical disadvantageous position, right? right? If, if you're an engineer in the group or you know anything about moments, right, it's a force times the distance. Well, if I'm doing retraction, which if you really think about a simplified version of it, I'm trying to bring my shoulder blades in towards my spine. Uh, that's that's going to really lengthen, lengthen this out here. And I'm, I'm going to start with a lot of tension already built up in my pec. pec. But, but at, at that point, it's, it's going to be elongated past the point of usefulness. usefulness. You've got you an elasticity in the muscle that's kind of correlated to how much force production you're going to get out of it. And much, much like a rubber band that you stretch too far, uh, there's, there's a good, good or bad limit, limit to it. Yep. Yeah, nice. Anyway, what I'm doing when I wiggle, I'm trying to create that depression, depression okay? okay? So he's, he's pretty, pretty much trying to find the depression and centering himself on the bench. Because when you do it in one go, you're sometimes not centered, which of course we want. Because uh, we don't want more weight to one side than the other. So he's wiggling to, de uh, to depress very nicely. What also the depression does, by the way, is engage those lats very nicely again. Uh, just as in the squat where we said pull down with the bar to get those lats going, depression does the same for your lats in the, uh, in the bench press. Uh, quick, quick note why you want, want that, the lat is attached very low uh, on your, on your, on your uh, uh, spine. Forgot the, the name of the part of the spine, spine. Um, but, but having more tension, tension there uh, allows you to keep your arch better, better right? If, if I pull my lats and it's attached from here to here and it flexes, it does this as well. So it keeps my arch nicer, which, which we're going to uh, go over in a bit. bit. So, so he, he just, just found his shoulders. So then the second thing he's going to do, which he's a bit bothered by, is no things, things on the bench, bench usually not there. there. It's, it's finding, finding his feet. feet. It's, it's fine. fine. We'll, we'll turn it around later. <laughs> uh, what, what I mean by finding his feet is he's going to find a position where preferably his knees are lower than his hips, where he can drive back on those depressed uh, shoulder blades. So he's making tension back into his shoulders with the legs. This is also what we call leg drive. It's very nice. Then he's going to unrack the bar. See how he drives his hips up to create that tension, tension, tension. It's very nice. He's going to set the hips back down. They're down. He's going to take a big breath because he's arched, right? There's a gap below his back. Here's my hand. Uh, he wants this to stay high, as high as he can to reduce range of motion because he wants to lift the maximum amount of weight. He's going to take a big breath, trying to create tension here, trying to get those lats. He's going to lower the bar, keeping the tension, reaching for the bar even, and, and he's, he's going, going to press. press. Boom. Boom. Very, Very nice, nice record. Awesome. One, One key point, point about, about the press, press though. Uh, your abdominals are already, already in extension, extension there, so it's, so it's not, not really, really so much, much to build tension. tension. Uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of times with heavy arches, arches in the bench press, press we'll, we'll get, get very bad back cramps. So what, so what you're, you're doing by creating that uh, proper, it's not really so much a brace right now, but by engaging your abdominals, you're providing the lumbar support. Uh, so, so that, that way, way those muscles, muscles when you're contracting, they're not putting your spine in such a... What's a good point like that? Yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're kind, kind of mitigating the amount of extreme curvature towards, towards the base of the spine. spine. So, so you're, you're not going to get those really heavy erector cramps as they insert to the, the fucking top, top of that. To the top of that. Swear words. Hey, you know what's coming on. But, but really, it just, just kind of helps balance out, right? Uh, they're antagonistic muscle groups. If my erectors contract, my abs go up. But we can remedy that by building a little bit of support by doing the proper breathing. And then we can keep the back cramps at bay. Pretty much. Also, another reason why the back cramp keeps at bay, then the erectors are, of course, causing you to 
to make that arch, right? They have to contract to keep in that arch. So the less load we can put on the erectors in the bench press, the less force they have to produce in that shortened position, the less likely they are to cramp, right? So that's also another reason why uh, we want a little bit of air to support those erectors. You just don't want it to cramp. If it happens, your bench is done, pretty much. It's very hard to clean it. You can, of course, but it is very, very inefficient. It's, it's not, not, it's not, not it's not. Um, on, on the bench, bench press, press um, well, uh, maybe, maybe toes, toes up, or uh, uh, heels, heels up or heels down, down a little bit. You guys are all IPF. Q&A, yeah, that's fine. fine. Um, would, would you like to hear, hear any more bench tips? Tell us in the, the chat real quick. Some engagement, engagement is always fun, no? And Emil starts start sweating. Yeah, 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 I told him about the squat, man. That's yeah. His, yeah. No, 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 he's sweating because I gave him a Can number for the end of the Can you talk a bit about leg drive? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, leg drive, common faults. So, assuming you can build proper tension in your back and your arch, really, honestly, if you don't have good spinal mobility, don't worry about making a big arch. Being able to arch 13 to 15 degrees more is not going to help your bench altogether that much. That's really just kind of the hand you're dealt with uh, in terms of, uh, if you want the lazy explanation, it's your genetics, right? My spinal mobility is kind of a function of my athletic background and my current available. Uh, then again. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so you're going to base up, do the scapular depression. You're going to get that. You got your hand placement. All good here. Uh, and what I did after I got my scaps depressed and I got my hands set when I had my feet on the bench, uh, if we walk back through that, uh, you need to find a foot placement that's comfortable for you. You'll see a lot of times one of the biggest culprits for missed benches that really shouldn't happen, you'll see hip drive off the bench, right? You see people all the time get called for this in competition and they don't know why. And it's not so much anything that you're doing wrong, it's just you're trying to produce leg drive uh, but you're funneling it through inappropriate channels. That being said, um, what are we trying to do when we create leg drive, right? Uh, the basic idea is we're going to flex the quads because the quads extend the knee, and that, if we're based and we're static on the bench, doing such a thing helps create drive and force production momentum off the chest once you get the press command. Uh, more or less, it just helps you get heavier weight, honestly. Uh, but you'll see a lot of times. You'll see a lot of times, uh, people don't really know how to leg drive correctly. So they'll come in here, they'll get tight, they'll do all this, they'll have lazy feet, uh, and then they'll come in here, and you'll see them go down, 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 and then they get the press command, and they pop off the bench, throw their hips off. So what did the lifter that does this uh, do wrong at the start? What can they improve on? So How can they avoid this? What's happening here is you've got the quad drive extending the hip. You're Quads trying to extend the knee, the knee is in a bit of a fixed position if you have your heel in a proper place uh, for your foot placement. So since the knee can't extend, it's going to go to the next mobile joint, which is your hip. And if your knee can't extend and your hips pop up, well, there's only two ways you can go. You can go to the wall or you can go up. That's the nice thing about having the bench. It kind of takes out that element of rotation in the third plane. So. For when you see out there. a lifter come in here and their hips shoot up, what's happening is they're not limiting, they're not, uh, limiting their hip restriction enough. And because of that, they're putting their pelvis to the ceiling. Doesn't help you at all. You will get red lighted for that in competition. Every single time, I would know it's my number one fault. Um, so my hack around this, and again, individuals will require uh, more or less coaching on this, depending on how bad you are at it. Uh, I'm quite guilty of it when I start getting into heavier weights. Uh, you really need to find a way to restrict the hips. So you can uh, do some soft tissue mobilization in your glutes. Uh, you can mess around with cueing your abductors, not your adductors, uh, to keep in a short position, which uh, you'll hear a lot of times tension in the legs uh, throughout a bench press, and that cue comes in various form. But more or less, your hips are going to pop off because your tension is not consistent throughout the entirety of the lift. So you will go from a starting position where you have a good rack, you've got tightness in your upper back, everything's fine, you'll set your hips, and then on the way down, you'll get lazy. 
and this will stop firing, and this will go to a relaxed position. And then when you try to drive off the floor, you'll do the little motorcycle kick. And because you're not keeping properly tension in your hip flexors, they're going to go up. So honestly, what I do to cure mine, I just rotate my toes out a bit, and I get cool to yell at me, knees out. Sometimes really all it is is just you need a tactile feedback in some kind of uh, audible or tangible manner uh, in order to keep your brain. Oh, OK, hips down, back, easy. It's just a very nuanced thing that you need time and experience to get overcome. Yeah, 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 pretty much. So uh, quick fix is just like keeping more consistent leg drive from the moment you unrack to the moment you press. You should already be driving. Get your training partner to bring attention to it. That is pretty the much. number one way pretty much. to have a feedback mechanism of some yeah, kind. Yeah, yeah. Also, play around. Uh, play around with your feet positioning. Maybe you need them wider and maybe you need them closer. Don't get fixed on one position. If you have a problem, there is something that needs fixing, try and play around with it. Don't be religious on your own method, which is pretty important, I think. There. Uh, we have some more questions coming in. How do you avoid your legs from cramping? Do you mean the sides here in the bench press? Are you uh, talking about your hips? Are you talking about your hips? Quads. Oh, honestly, never had that nor heard of anybody that had that. Maybe you need more salt, buddy. Where are you talking about? Are you talking <laughs> closer to the pelvis or more towards the knee? Your quads and hands cramp in the bench press. So hamstrings make sense, right? Your quads are trying to extend the knee, which means your hamstrings, by antagonistic relationship, they're contracting. I have this problem a lot in competitions. Um, if you're doing a heavy bench right after a heavy squat, and you do a low bar squat, for example, and you're very reliant on your uh, posterior chain loading, your hamstrings aren't going to be fatigued in terms of force production, but just by the lengthening contraction of a heavy squat, they're going to get fatigued. Um, normally, what I would recommend doing, if you're going to squat and bench heavily in the same day, if you do a little bit of soft tissue work, or you can do uh, some dynamic mobility uh, to kind of not so much loosen it up, because if it muscle is pre-tensioned, there's probably a reason. We don't want to try to statically stretch that, uh, but you can do some mobility work to address that area of concern and get enough range of motion in that hamstring that you shouldn't have the problem with the cramps. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd also recommend uh, if you train after a long stressful day of school, you can run through your salt and electrolytes very fast. So maybe take some extra magnesium, extra salt, extra potassium uh, before you train. Uh, regulate the amounts, know how much you're taking, and experiment with that a little bit. If it doesn't help, just stop it. If it does, it's an easy fix. You're probably maybe uh, uh, underhydrated. Uh, also, for your quads cramping too, since if you think about the bench, as we said, they extend the knee. They're not so much being retracted. Uh, you might have some tension in your like, so as an iliacus that's kind of pulling on one of those top heads. Uh, if you want to do something like a light warm-up, some body weight split squats, for example, uh, just to kind of get a little bit of range of motion and feeling in there, uh, that's one thing that I like to do before a bench. I oftentimes have uh, very tight hips pre-bench, and that will mess up my ability to keep my butt on the bench. Uh, not so much give me quad cramps, though. That sounds yeah. like more of an extreme case. Yeah. Uh, Shiame, you're sliding back in the bench press. Last question we get to before we go to the deadlift. Um, I see you already have chalk on your back, and you push your shoulders in, okay. Do you train in a dry fit shirt or a cotton shirt? I'm looking at the most obvious. The material on your bench cotton. is probably to be. Okay, you, you wear cotton shirts with magnesium, but you still slide. A lot of benches are very slick. Uh, a little hack you can do, you can take a yoga mat, put it on top, or uh, what are those little floor pads that you guys put on? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. anti-slip mats. It's basically fabric that you put under a carpet in your home. You can, like, cut out a nice mat and you don't slip. It might just be that you're covering the fabric. You can also use a yoga mat, which looks a bit retarded, but it, oh, no swearing, which looks a bit strange, but it works. You put this over the bench, you're done. It honestly uh, might not be any fault of your own. It might just be that contact surface. No, you can't. No, like I know. So, Shame, uh, for you, it might be uh, a, a nice idea to send, if you have a bench video, to either me or Wyatt, and we can help you out in person real quick. Uh, just figuring this out will take more time than I want to invest in this right now. I want to move on to the deadlift. Uh, I mean, or in the Q&A room, or in the Q&A room, but you can shoot us a message. Uh, at Diddy Kong Strong, at the Hair Coon, easy. Uh, 
Uh, all right, done this, I think. Yeah, we have uh, 20 minutes per lift-ish, and this has been 20 minutes, so let's move. And just because there are two different styles of deadlifting, we'll go over conventional and sumo. You can see the weak boy stance and then the strong boy stance. You can see the good deadlift and you can see the pussy. I mean, you can see what used to be cool deadlift. and what has all the world records right now. I still don't live more though. I might weigh 40 kilos more, but that's the one thing I do have. Ask me about my dots. I don't want to. Uh, okay, we had a stripe for the deadlift. This is right here, a nice marking. Is this right? Yeah, okay, we got it. All right, deadlifts. Can you take this? I'll come back for some more. No, leave me alone. Yeah, it's oh, someone put in the IG handles. Nice. Oh, that's us. Nice, thanks, dude. Now we get some clout. All right. We have the conventional. Twenty-three more. Fall. Twenty-two. Oh, somebody dipped out. We're not interesting enough. We just had twenty-three. Because yeah, I know conventional is whack. <laughs> Bit of shenanigans in between is fine. All right. So deadlifts. Um, deadlifts is pretty much picking a bar up from the floor uh, and extending your body. So. A deadlift is slightly different than the squat and the bench press. Of course, the motion is different, but we do not have a lowering phase of the weight. It is only a lifting phase, right? The bar starts dead on the floor and we have to lift it. Why is this different? Um, what I notice when I see a general public deadlift is it's harder to create tension because uh, there is no lowering phase. You have to create all your tension before you even pull uh, on the bar before you execute your deadlift. Um, so first, I just I'll just demonstrate a deadlift, uh, and after I will stop laughing, Ramco. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, Ramco's behind the camera. For those of you who know him, he's very annoying. That's fine. <laughs> so okay, shenanigans are fine, like I just said. I will demonstrate the deadlift. After I will tell you my thoughts of what I do when I deadlift and what you can do or maybe don't. So. First things, grab the bar. Oh, I hit the rack, oopsie. <laughs> One more time, I stand. Boom, all right. So top to bottom, I'm going to turn the bar front face the camera for a bit. Um, I'm in shoes, these are trainers. They're not ideal to deadlift in, but it's fine. I have stinky shoes, I don't want to bother the rest. Uh, stinky feet, I mean. Uh, right here, it's fine. Uh, okay, so foot positioning in the deadlift. Ah, it's fine, I'm making jokes, it's good. Uh, <laughs> foot positioning in the deadlift. In a conventional deadlift, why we'll do the sumo? It's very different. In a conventional deadlift, I want my feet uh, at about hip width, so straight down from the legs, right? Uh, why? Because I also want my hands to go down straight from the shoulder. I don't want to be wider because I increase range of motion. So if I stand out wider, I have to grab wider because I got to grab the bar outside of my knees. This is less efficient than this because here my hands go straight down. I have the least range of motion, right? So foot position first, just find hip width. Then your feet, you can either point them straight or rotate out slightly. This is my preference because it gives me more space in the hips because I can get my knees out slightly, slightly. Again, not too much, because then I'm basically back at this with smaller feet. Okay, so I'm finding my feet. Second thing I'm doing, where is the bar in correlation to my feet? Again, I want them over the middle, the middle of my foot. What is the middle of my foot? That's usually the little bone at the top of your foot. So if I'm looking down, I want the bar aligned with the top of my feet. Why do I want this? So I still have some wiggle room to get into a nice position. Then, grabbing the bar, like I just said, right down there, it's usually at the start of the neural, the rougher part of the bar. Then I can come in because I just had that little bit of room because the bar is at the middle of my foot, not against my shin. I come in, I lift my chest, and both feet go up. So, side angle, we go again. Let's not Tap the rack this time, I want to keep it nice and clean. So, found my feet. This is the most important part. Uh, the bracing again, we just started with that with the squat. In the deadlift, you can brace 
before you lift, before you lower, or you can brace at the bottom, top brace or bottom brace. Depends on what you like. I like to top brace uh, just because you can feel my abdominals more when I'm standing up than when I'm bending down. So, almost out of breath from lifting 60 kilos two times. Wow. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> so, what do I do first? I take a big breath again. I make some nice intra-abdominal pressure. All right. Go down to the bar and I try to lever the bar off the floor. See that I try to extend. This is my start. Ah, oh, extend off. I don't want to do this too much actually. What we call this wedging. Is like, this is what we call wedging exactly. Nice going from Wyatt. I'm trying to wedge myself. This is an ideal. I'm trying to wedge myself in closer to the bar and then lead with my T-spine almost, right? So T-spine is the upper part of your spine. Can you touch my T-spine for a quick second? Yeah. Yeah, 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 just quickly. So the term for this, T-spine extension. This right there. Ooh, I want to do this. So it doesn't mean I want to do this. I'll do this. See, a little bit. Whilst maintaining that brace, all right? So top brace again. Grabbing in, up in the T-spine. Bam, leave. Notice, notice how the bar does not leave my body once it's off the floor. It keeps in contact. Why lever arm? You're an engineer, I'm not. I want a smaller lever arm to be, uh, to make the weight the lightest as possible. Right, so, we got in that nice position. Then what I see a lot of people doing in conventional deadlift, and what you see in gyms in general, is hip shooting up first. So, Instead of starting here, they're yanking their hips back and then pulling through. This is what we don't want. Why? My hamstrings aren't as strong as my hamstrings and quads combined, which is very nice. So I want to use those quads as well. So what do I do? I try and create a leg presses, and that's why I want to lever. I want to hang back a little bit, get those quads involved too. Boom, lift, and in. Also, if I don't let my hip shoot up, I'm in a more advantageous uh, position at, uh, for the lockout part. Lockout part is what we generally refer to when the bar is past the knees. So watch, nice position. Lockout here is just making love to the bar, getting your hips in. If I'm going here, shooting my hips up first, lockout is a hell of a long part, see? Ooh, if you drag it all along. All right, so stay nice and close to the bar. Lift up. I'm almost there, why you can almost start? We're almost there. So again, uh, same as in the bench presses and in the deadlift, uh, sorry, squat, I want lat engagement as well for more spine rigidity. I don't want to fold in a deadlift, right? The cat back, I don't want that. So what do I do? I grab the bar, I get my shoulders back, right? Not depressed. I mean, not retracted, excuse me, but depressed. So, I'm already pulling the shoulders back, getting some tension in the bar, trying to lift up already, sitting into it, nice and tense lats, and I go. All right, enough for now. That was almost 10 minutes of deadlift explaining. Why? Right, get some comments. Point. One little key point about conventional. Can you go back to that uh, little position? Right, I might pull sumo, but I promise I pull conventional more than most of you. Uh, a lot of the faults that you'll see with these uh, big boys that think they can pull strong, go ahead and reach down and grab the bar. I already got a back pump, dude. That's your fault, not mine. Yeah, I know. You will see people wait to breathe until they are in this pancaked position. Now, tell me how well can you breathe when you're bent over like that, basically hugging your knees? It's not great. That's why I just Probably said... not the best. That's why I said I personally top raise. Pretension. Right? Pretension, yeah, sure. So the way you'll see that, you'll kind of see people arbitrarily start to hip hinge a little bit, and then you just kind of, just a little exhale. You don't really have to go crazy with it. You don't need to like full on set your brace at the beginning because at that point, you're just exerting energy for no reason. You're just sweating to look cool. Pretty much. So. What do you want me to do? A little pre-tension before you go down to reach the bar. Right? And just by pre-tensioning here and breathing into those obliques, now when he reaches down to grab it, you can already see his spine is in a lot better position. And when he pulls up with his T-spine, like I got a string right here, 
you can see how much easier it is. So the deadlift is the rawest, but also the most nuanced lift, uh, depending on how you look at it. Uh, brute strength will carry you a long way to this, but it won't get you a lockout. Uh, stacked joints are strong joints, and that is most true in the deadlift. It's not like a squat where we can cave to find a position of comfort in order to finish the lift. Uh, deadlift, you really need to maintain that stacked position in order to complete the lift. Otherwise, you'll find some way of not being able to lock it out. This is that this is that difference that I uh, referred to at the start of the explanation, right? It's not. There's no eccentric face. It's just yeah. going back to it, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. All right, epic. Um, why it's going to go into the sumo deadlift now? Keep your questions about the conventional deadlift for the Q and A, please. I'm moving out of the screen. Good luck, Wyatt. All right. So. Everlasting debate, conventional versus sumo, we all know what it is. Uh, if you don't, jump on Instagram for two minutes, you'll find out very quickly. Uh, conventional boys have very soft feelings. So, sumo deadlift. Why do we want to do this? Well, there are different muscle groupings that are strong on different people. People that really sit into their quads with a squat uh, and have strong backs. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Joey Mine, I just there. Guy is a tank, pulls conventional clean as butter. Uh, Joey's back is the size of a wall, and his quads are the size of my torso, right? So Joey pulling conventional is honestly just a beauty to behold. Uh, I'm not that big, so I can't get away with it, so I do my cheat hack of sumo. Uh, sumo, compared to conventional deadlift, a lot more posterior chain hip engagement, and far less reliance on the back if done correctly. Uh, at this point, your quad strength and your hip mobility will be driving your ability to A, pull weight, B, finish the pull. So, how are we going to set up for sumo? What's the difference? Well, conventional, we have our hands outside of the legs. And the basic delineation that we use for sumo versus conventional, my hands are on the inside, right? Uh, you will see any number of stances for people pulling like this, the guys pulling out here really doesn't matter. It's all considered some form of sumo variant. That again, semantics, we're not worried about that here. So when I'm doing a sumo pull, first things first, I don't know if you'll notice or not from this camera angle, maybe we should turn a bit this way. Uh, the rotation that you're able to achieve with this hip is going to dictate a lot of how you set up for this lift. Uh, your ability to externally rotate and tension your glute is going to really drive where your foot position is going to be on this. Some people will have very narrow stance. It's completely fine. It's a bit more back, very lat dominant. Uh, I know a guy, Zach Ramstow, pulls 325 in this stance, so this can work. Uh, for those of you to be on the other opposite end of this, if you know Sean Noriega, he pulls with his toes completely out here, and he pulls 335, so it can work. It really just depends on the person. Uh, when we're doing sumo, we're going to line up in a position such that my knee is stacked over my ankle. What are we coming back to? Stacked joints or strong joints. My line of drive through this is going to be from my quads. So I want my quads to be able to flex effectively. That's not going to happen if my knees are pointed away and my patella tendon is turned facing this way, but my foot's facing that way. It's not very efficient force production and translation. Again, also exter or antithesis of that, if I'm over-rotating to the outside, I'm pushing this out putting my ligaments in a very dangerous position, and there's no real need to do that. So I encourage you, if you want to try sumo, start from blocks. It's the best way to do it, work your way down, because at that time, you'll also be able to get your hip mobility. Coming back to it now, me personally, I tend to go with my shins right outside of the rings. I'm not as mobile today as I normally am on a training day because I'm quite lazy. Uh, don't be bad like me. Uh, so when we come in for a sumo, one thing, too, you'll see with people, lazy feet. I know, I know, a lot of foot tension. Blame Trevor Jaffe, that's all he yells at me for. Uh, you'll see lazy feet, very passive feet, again. And an uh, example of this, Noriega, great sumo deadlifter. He loses balance all the time because he does not have good foot engagement. Uh, not to take away from him, because man's got a clean pull. Uh, you want to do to kind of trick yourself out of that and properly cue in the foot, uh, just a very slight bit. You want to try to turn your toes very slightly towards the weight. Doing that will create what we call lateral tension through the floor, right? By spreading the floor, you're engaging the adductors, which are going to stabilize your knee uh, while your quads are extending in a sumo deadlift. So I'm going to line up where I'm comfortable, and then I'm going to come in here, and then foot angle, also semantics for deadlift. 
you're really going to depend on the person again. Your hip mobility will fully drive that. Uh, I'm going to come in, I'm going to set up, I'm going to create a little bit of lateral tension just by spreading the floor very ever so slightly. You'll feel a bit of activation in your glutes if you're doing it properly. Uh, now when I come down, sumo is kind of nice because I can achieve a bit more of a stacked upper body position than conventional, so to say, because the distance between the bar and my hips is decreased. I'm not so much leveraging as I am uh, really trying to extend my hips forward. So when I set up for a sumo and I have my foot position, uh, again, as Kuhn pointed out, we're going to leave two to three centimeters of spacing from the bar. Because as we go down, our knees are going to rotate and they're going to extend a little bit forward. And we want to be able to grab the bar from an advantageous position. Ideally, hands stacked with the shoulders. Stacked joints are strong joints. Uh, so when we come down for a sumo, we can already pre-tension, uh, get a little bit of abdominal pressure here. But again, we're not going to fully brace yet because if I'm squeezing like a fish here, it's going to be really hard for me to get down into position. Right, because I've got way too much tension to get into a good position. So we're going to set our feet, come in, create a little bit of lateral tension in the floor. We're going to go down, get a little bit of tension. Uh, at this point now, some of you have much longer arms than I do. Uh, like Remco, for example, this guy would already be touching the bar. Not all of us are that lucky. Uh, anyway, as you're going to do, you're going to reach into it. But when you're reaching down to grab the bar, you're not sinking your hips, right? We're not squatting down. Hinging, that's the name of the game in deadlift. You're using your hamstrings, you're in your ass. It's a way bigger muscle than your quad. Trust me, this will help you a lot. So you're going to come down, you're going to hinge into it. And at that point, you'll be able to load your hamstrings, and then you grab. Now, hook grip under over, I don't care what you do, just squeeze the bar really hard, no matter how you want to grip it. It doesn't really matter, you're activating the same muscles. Uh, so when you come down, you get your grip. For my sumo deadlifters, here is the final position where we're going to brace, right? At this position, because my pelvis and my rib cage are still able to be neutrally aligned, I'm going to grab the bar. And when I do that, I'm going to take a big breath. And when I do that, I'm going to pull my shoulders back. This is T-spine expansion. This is much more important in a sumo deadlift than it is conventional. Your T-spine extension will really make your lockout in a sumo deadlift. So I come down, I grab the bar, big brace. It's that simple, right? The whole premise of sumo being a more uh, finesse movement is you're able to stack much better than a conventional deadlift, which is why it's mechanically just so much more of a better position to be in. Tell that to Jamal Browner. All right. Um, yeah. We'll be on a five-minute break, and now we'll be back for the Q&A. Stay around, because that's the most interesting part, I think. Oh, we're back. Hello. Welcome to the Q&A. Uh, this will be a bit more nonchalant. Uh, we are sending less. You are going to ask questions. Yeah. Anything so you want. Please, ask away. ask away. Doesn't matter. Go for it. Yeah. Rishi, what's your skincare routine, boy? Rishi got that cocoa butter. Got a little exfoliation going on. I don't see a lot of questions. Maybe people aren't back to their laptops yet. Are y'all going to leave get us the, hanging? You got the little poll on IG. Would hurt though, it would hurt. I take it personally if there's no questions. Anybody or it means we did Instagram. everything right and you know everything there is to know now. Could also be the case. No questions? All right. Siame, Shame, is that how I say it? I think it's about right. Can you say hi if you're in the chat? Or we just start with your question about the bench press sliding. Oh, there we go. Long legs and short upper body. Embrace deadlifts. Yeah. <laughs> That's Remco. Do you have any tips if you have relative? Well, I mean, if you have, if you have, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I see that you can struggle with your squat. I understand so, that. Um, <clears throat> this is pretty much what your girlfriend's struggling with too, right? Yeah. So uh, your God blessed gifts are going to make your life pretty hard uh, for squat. And that's okay. Uh, really. When it comes to building a squat with a disadvantageous, uh, you know, Leverages, condition such arms. as a long femur, uh, really, repetition is uh, ah, yes. repetition is going to be your friend here. Um, 
honestly, you're probably going to need to program more quad targeted variations at a bit higher volume. Yeah. Uh, I would say. Yeah, so, so it's, it's pretty tough, right? Uh, the quad, if you have long femurs, has to cross a longer uh, surface area, which makes it less advantageous to produce force, which is kind of annoying. So uh, you can kind of somewhat play around that in the squat um, by just trying to put more emphasis on your, 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 your glutes in your back, kind of, um, which, is, which is kind of tough in of itself because it makes balancing a bit harder. Um, can we get the... That's fine. I can do it like this. Um, so, a bit back for a side angle. Um, if you have pretty uh, long femurs, you don't want to drive your knees too much in the squat because this position isn't going to work for you. Don't watch my feet. It's ugly as hell right now, but it's fine. Um, so, what you kind of want to do is engage a little bit more with the glutes and you really have to find your depth. You are not going to be someone that is going to squat super deep, right? So, you have to kind of find where you skim that line of depth, right? So if I got that bar on my back, I really want to engage by sitting back. Notice how my knees aren't going forward too much. I can still drive my knees out, hit depth. They're still not too much forward, go in. Also, widening out your stance might really help because the wider I am, the less forward knee travel I need to get into my squat. Okay, so generally, wider stance, more hip engagement in your squat is going to help you a lot. You just don't, you want to develop your quads, but they're not the most ideal part to use in your squat, right? Your accessory, work, add, your accessory work should kind of target your hips and your quads, as Kuhn said. Uh, if you really want to get a feel for how to initiate the <coughs> squat, uh, as he said, a wider stance will be beneficial. That might feel foreign to you. Uh, what you can do is add a little bit of a tempo in your warm-up sets. Say you're warming up with 40 kilos, will normally feel like nothing on your back, and that's fine. Uh, Submaximal load is really where you should be implementing new uh, nuances to your technique and movement pattern. So I would say if you're going to practice with a wider stance and you want to target your quad and hips with the accessory movements, uh, what you can do is practice loading. You're going to have to, by default, because of the knee to hip distance, you're going to have to load posteriorly more than a normal person would. I'm short femur boys, so when I do it, I'm here, I'm good to go. Right? I can just squat, sit on my ankles, and I'm good to go. Uh, you, however, are probably going to have to be a little bit more nuanced and deliberate with your uh, breaking at the hips at the start of the squat. So you can practice this by adding the tempo to it. Really just slow things down, right? You're going to come in, you're going to hinge, you're going to have more posterior chain and hip engagement anyway, so you might as well take advantage of it. So when you come back and you hinge, then you can just slow it down and really feel it. Yeah. And you will get more and more comfortable with it, and as you develop those muscles, you'll get stronger and stronger. Your deadlift is probably always going to be higher than your squat in that regard, but that's fine. doesn't mean you can't have a good squat. There's plenty of people that have a great squat having such femur limbs. Um, can we scroll up a little bit? Can we scroll up a little bit? Uh, yeah, so who asked the, this question? Uh, a little one. bit more? No, no, no. Next one. No, yeah, but who asked this first question? One more. Tineke. Um, is this new information for you? Did we help you, yes or no? Let us know. Haha. <laughs> also nice to hear. To hear. Um, let's continue with, yeah, quickly, Shimai's question. Uh, his question was, I still slide on the bench press. Um, so sometimes... The issue with sliding on the bench press is simply, oh, I'm laying on the microphone thingy. Hold on. Oh, there we go. Don't want to kill that. Can you hold it for me? Sure. Yeah, sure. So sometimes it might be your setup, right? If you're sliding on the bench, you might be too much on your shoulder blades instead of on your traps kind of deal. So what you want to do, let's imagine I have the bar here, right? Um, before I start giving any drive, because I'm going to slide here as well right, because I'm flat on the bench. So before I start to drive anywhere, I want to get my traps in the bench. That's why I create that arch, right, that arch in my, my T-spine. I want my trapezius muscles into the bench. If I drive now, I'm going to slide way less. I'm giving the exact same amount of drive, yeah? Um, so that might be just a setup thing. Let's try and get your traps on the bar instead of your back, because I'm still slightly arched now, but I'm on my shoulder blades. Sh oh, shoulder blades. It's a flat surface. So I'm going to slide more. Um, if that's not your problem, 
I again recommend to shoot us a message with a clip of your bench, maybe, because we might need more information. Yeah, I would say in the meantime, if it's an issue that you can't uh, overcome by manipulating the surface of the bench, uh, work on your leg drive. You need to keep consistent leg drive. If you're setting up with your traps and your shoulders in a stacked position and you have consistent leg drive, uh, basically what I mean by that is don't so much do the gas pedal push off when you do uh, <coughs> Pause rep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you keep consistent leg drive, I promise you, you will get the same explosiveness off your chest, though you probably won't feel like it. But at the same time, if you're setting up with maximal tension in your leg, uh, you're not going to drive anywhere because your hips are already engaged and they're locked in position. Uh, I would also say, though, uh, the bench that you're probably benching on is not to comp standard in terms of the surface material. So slap a band on it. Slap the yoga mat on there. I know you said it's not comp specific. Well, the comp bench is also got a much more grippy surface, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Tini, can we help you? Awesome, cool, it's nice to hear, awesome. Um, can we scroll up a little bit? Oh no, this is the next question. What advice would you give uh, for people searching for a coach? That's actually a really, really good question, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think, form for it. huh? A form for it. Yeah, we in Iser Stack have a form for it, but if you're not in Iser Stack, of course, and you're asking this question in a general sense, I think Wyatt got some very strong points on this for the love of god do your research hmm? don't for coaching right for iser stack there's a you want somebody that can help you develop your lifts you don't want somebody with a good of course sales you want pitch. to be coached by me promote yourself aha okay no, just... you want somebody with a good <laughs> resume of lifter uh lifter development you don't want somebody with a good sales pitch right uh, i can show you the best marketing <clears throat> in the world but my program could be uh well, poop emoji more yeah. or less uh you want somebody with a good reputation for developing their lifters, which you can see as a body of work. And uh, by all means, my, I myself, whenever I was looking around for my coaches in the beginning, uh, man, I would find lifters that were coached by these people. And, uh, you know, I would ask them questions, yeah. not necessarily specifics on pricing or their specific style, just more so of uh, if I ask them a question, what type of feedback am I going to receive? How in depth, uh, you know, what's the relationship communication yeah. going to be wise? Yeah. How much yeah. are they yeah. going to invest into me if I invest into them? So yeah, the, the, the big thing for me is a lot of coaches ask for a pretty steep price. This is my coach, by the way, very cute. Yeah. Mm. Um, <laughs> a lot of coaches ask for a pretty steep price. So if you're paying, for example, 150, 200 bucks a month for coaching, you want your freaking value. If the man's just going to say, good job, see you next time, Honestly, fuck that guy. He's not going to help you. He's not going to make you better. You want value. You're paying a lot of money for a coach, right? So if he's not giving you constructive feedback and it's just a cheerleader, it's worthless. You're not paying for a cheerleader. You're paying for a freaking coach. Coaching is a service. <laughs> All right. Right. It's not a right. It's if, a service you're paying for. If you're interested in a certain coach as well, like Wyatt said, look up some athletes of the coach. See how they move. Is their movement nice? Did it imp improve over time? Not even necessarily the numbers, but the quality of the movement. Did it get better over time or is the form still eh? Because uh, that probably means the progression over time will remain eh. It's not worth it, all right? You want your value. Did we answer your question? Let us know. We're moving on to the next question. I have not been lifting till now since closing of the gyms. Sucks. I know, it's hard. What's the best way to start lifting when gyms go open? Low intensity, high volume. Very, 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 very low intensity. You need very little stimulus for high adaptation, all right? You are pretty much a noob again. You might be able to squat 200, but a 100 kilo squat might give you the same stimulus as a 200 kilo squat. So start super low. Don't pay attention to triple singles, doubles, fives, nothing of that. Start working on your muscle mass. As soon as you get your muscle mass back, the numbers will follow. Start with a hypertrophy phase, the, low intensity, high volume, go. The important thing to do when you're first coming back, if you're a prior trained athlete or you've done competitions and you're G trained for longer than three months, uh, you really need to leave your ego at the door or you're going to hurt yourself. Very much. Don't start with a percentage-based program. <clears throat> Ideally, and this is a best case scenario, you will be G trained for at least the six, first six weeks you begin retraining. Um, so you really need to just focus on redeveloping that movement pattern. Uh, of course, as you take a more extensive time off, this will become more severe uh, and your muscle quality will degrade uh, when you first come back. So 
If you're less than six months, four to six weeks will be fine. Of course, your numbers aren't going to be what they were. But if you leave your ego at the door and properly build up uh, and reach your certain recoverable volume thresholds, you will be fine. Yep, yep, yep. Also, if you experienced aches and pains when the gym was open, when you could train regularly, and they're gone now, now is the time to keep it that way, right? There's no reason to injure yourself again or go into the same faulty movement patterns that created aches and pains. So that's also a quick tip in between. It's not the most relevant, but it's, it's something to consider. Um, all right, awesome. I know it really sucks having to build up again, uh, but it's a reality for Example. a lot of people. No, you're not alone. Just do better than the rest. You'll be, pick up faster. Easy. Example. Remco here. We all love him. We all know him. He's the baby face king of Eisersterk. Did not train for four to five months. <clears throat> uh, has found a way to train again recently. We won't go into how. Has found a way to train on a semi-regularly basis. His previous rep PR on deadlift prior to his break from powerlifting nice was example. 200, dead, 200 kilos for 10 reps. 220. 220. Yeah, 220. At RPE final, but we won't talk about that. I broke my Mac. <laughs> I broke the Mac. <laughs> okay. No, so yeah, his previous 10 RM was for the deadlift, was just a wrap out. It was 220. He's back um, to 190 for 11 now because where, he followed simple progression. Where, where did you start up with? 140? No. Less? You like started with 100 for 10 reps, less than 50% of a 10 RM, not even a 1 RM. All right. And he's back up to 190 for 11 now. He's back up to 190 for 11, exactly. He's, he's going pretty fast. That took you like, what, five weeks? Five, six weeks. All right. So it can go fast, but he left his ego at the door, focused on quality volume <laughs> and nice technique, and is going back now. I see some head. The 190 yeah. might have been final, but it's fine. Final. <laughs> <laughs> uh. It's okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, can we scroll up a bit again? We uh, need to see some questions. Uh, everything's recorded. I missed the part of the squat. Yeah, lifting till now, me too. When I do heavy squat, I have hip shooting up. Good morning. Ing. This is your... Hi, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you know me, I'm a squat princess. Uh, your hips yeah. aren't shooting up. Your bracing sucks. <clears throat> sorry to tell you that way. Uh, that's mainly what it is, man. Uh, shoot me a message and I will uh, give you all the details you want on that, but there is no such thing as a hip shoot in a squat. You lack torso rigidity and uh, are very inefficient in your movement translation. Uh, not to sound like a dick, but I, I'm more than 90% sure I know what's going on with that. If you have a video of your squat, send it to me. Uh, I already see Shamay sending you a video. Yeah. That's awesome, Shamay. He'll get back to you. Yeah. I promise I'm a lot nicer if you talk to me. <laughs> well, he's a jerk. It's fine. Uh, Nino, push chest up. Yeah, chest up, generally decent cue. No, it's but not. But what we, uh, the no, thing not. what we want to, want to avoid is uh, breaking your brace with pushing the chest up, right? That's not what we want. Chest up is a so. terrible cue. If anybody ever coaches you and gives that to you, fire them. Well, I mean... <laughs> there is no situation in a squat. No, 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 no. There's no situation in a squat where you ever want to put your chest up, right? Because then I'm doing Shakira titties. Unless you're squatting like this, saying chest up doesn't do anything, because no. then it would be going to neutral. No. But if I'm going like no. this, I don't need none of that. No, no, All no, right, no, no, so. no, no, no. Chest up will right. always cue you to do abdominal extension. It's a terrible cue, right? Instead of doing that, drive your traps through the bar, right? If I'm packing and I'm keeping my upper back tension, and I try to drive my fucking traps through the bar, I'm already going to come up with a neutral spine. Chest up is a terrible cue for squat. You will never change my mind. You pretty much don't want to break neutral spine. You don't want to get T-spine extension in the squat. Um, who asked the question? Uh, yeah, Nino. So Nino, send a video to White. He'll help you out. Uh, you can get a lot more constructive feedback than in this uh, format. All right. Should you avoid wearing a belt with training and focusing on technique? Or is it good with practicing uh, practice a lot with using a belt? We have differing opinions. Uh, it's different, different opinions, two sides, sides of a coin type thing. In my opinion, the quality of your brace shouldn't be different when wearing a belt versus not wearing a belt, right? So your brace should always be uh, good. Like what English? Your brace should always be very stable. All right, satisfactory. satisfactory. Oh. Whatever you want to name it. If you cannot brace without your belt, 
you are not bracing. So if that's an issue, lose the belt, work on your bracing again. If your brace is under control uh, and you keep the skill of bracing without the belt, I think training most uh, of your, uh, your, your work with the belt is fine. Wyatt has, has a different opinion on this, I know. He likes to lose the belt a lot. He, he will explain why, uh, but that's my opinion. The belt is a tool, right? A tool is not going to enhance your position. A tool is going to enhance what's already there. So if your bracing mechanics are crap, your bracing mechanics with the belt will be crap. Pretty much what uh, I said. You can't cover up dog poop by putting glitter on it. Uh, not saying that yours is. I haven't seen you specifically. Uh, but a belt, again, it's a tool, right? You're going to get as much out of it as you put into it. And if you cannot move satisfactorily without it, why would you put a Band-Aid on it? It's the same thing that I tell uh, people with very... Uh, in unstable hips and knees that like to squat and lifters and shake their knees like they're doing a boogie woogie. Uh, lose the heels for about six weeks, come back, and you'll be much stronger in your squat. It helped me. He told me to lose the heels. My squat wasn't terrible in the heels, but it just cleaned it up. Uh, it's just about... Don't, yeah, don't be hyper-focused on like getting your knees across your toes more or something to hit depth. It's not necessary. It's very uh, boring, but once you get the rooting and bracing down, the last 10% of your lift uh, is really going to be the semantics and little deviations. I think, after, I think after applying those two things, I lost the heels. Not that heels are necessarily bad. Joe Sullivan, world record squatter, squatted it in heels, I think, which is fine. Uh, but for me, getting the rooting in order, getting the brace better, understanding squat mechanics better. I think it took my squat from 270 to about 300 in a couple months. Um, so it might sound foreign to you, but it's, I'm telling you it's worth looking into. Um, any more? Oh, Tineke, we helped you. That's awesome. Copy out no for the belt and stuff. If it's not above 80%, you don't need your damn belt. You just need to suck it up. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. Did we, uh, did we, <laughs> fire moment. Oh, thanks, Rishi. Fuck. Oh, I can't swear. Sorry. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> um, did we help you about the belt question? Let us know, it will be awesome. Uh, my bracing sucks too, especially on, only with squatting. My face fucking explodes. That's a good thing I have like. Yeah, I'll send you some stuff on bracing. Believe me, if there's anybody that's gonna beat that into your head, it's me. Yeah, this is the brace, man. Every time after heavy squats, all the veins in my face. But I think, Shiny, that that's a genetic just thing. blood pressure, man. I might be blood, I, don't, I have the same thing. My face friggin' blows up after I do anything heavy. Uh, and heavy is not even like 80%, like 75%, it blows up my face, deadlift squats, bench not so much, but it's insane, I have like blood uh, veins like popping and stuff, uh, this guy for example does not, I know very few people that have it to the same extent as me, as I do, um, so far I haven't experienced any discomfort from it, so I haven't really looked into fixing it, um, might be a blood pressure thing, might be worth looking up, um, but yeah, I don't know, man. Might not be fixable. Squat as low. Squat as low as comfortable to comp standard. Now, uh, Alec, I don't know if you're a power lifter per se. Uh, if not, I wouldn't really worry about your depth too much. Honestly, hit parallel and you're fine. Yeah. Uh, general yeah, fitness, yeah. you don't need to go ass to grass. It's um, not really beneficial to you. In comp squats, yeah, just go to the comp standard depth. Uh, comp of course, standard but comfortable. You but don't comfortable, need to wipe your you butt on the Yeah, moment. exactly, exactly, exactly. If, however, of course, there is a variation in your program, for example, uh, high heel elevated squats, uh, then yeah, sure, get as deep as possible because the intention of that is to take the quads yeah. through a full range of motion. To bias the quads. So right, that's to wrong. bias the quads. You want to take them through as large a range of motion. That's why you got to go lower. Um, if that hurts you, get it locked at and avoid it for a while. Um, but that will be the only reason to go as low as you Pain free progression will keep you in the sport for longer and lead to much more sustainable strength gains. Yeah, and when I say don't do it for a while, it doesn't mean avoid it at all. Of course, try and attack the point of pain and reintroduce, see if it's gone, right? Don't avoid injury. Sure. Want to get it fixed. <laughs> I know if I squat low enough when squatting, uh, ask me, your boyfriend, and I'll um, tell you that you're squatting high. As as you do. Uh, let's see, uh, squat is, okay, yeah, Masha. Uh, ask so this, me, your boyfriend, ask because the I'll boyfriend tell you that you're squatting if you're, high. Yeah, but, but she's alone then. So I if you're squatting, yeah, I know. If you're squatting to depth, and we are power lifters, I hope we squat a lot. So at some point, the neural pattern should become a constant and a standard. 
Uh, you'll feel when you hit depth, this is called proprioception. Um, if you don't and you're insecure, okay. film your set, look at it. It's not deep enough, go a bit deeper. It's too deep, go a bit higher. If you're by yourself, always film your sets. There's nothing wrong with filming. I often Being don't honest film. with yourself is how you're going to get results. Yeah, I often don't film and I get roasted for it. So film your stuff so you and your coach can see. Ow. Uh, I like your cut, G. <laughs> Uh, okay, next one. Then I'll just accept looking like Lord Dracula three days a week. Yeah, that's man. all right. Honestly, sometimes I look like that for like a friggin' month. Bro, none of us started this part. None look, of us started this part because we look good. I just deadlifted today. You can maybe even see a couple red spots. I you just know. blur your shit. Oh, nice. None I'm of us sorry. started this sport because we look pretty. If we did, we'd be bodybuilders. <laughs> um, should you breathe between reps of B BSD? Uh, what's BSD, what's, my guy? What's, what's BSD? Bench? I've heard you shouldn't you breathe on bench. You shouldn't breathe on bench whilst moving. Oh, SBD. Okay. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, don't breathe during the movement. That's this is a misconception. Thing. You can breathe as long as you don't lose your position. Right? So, king Which of the Which usually squat happens gear. when you breathe. So only if you're very, very, very certain of your technique, you can breathe during the lift. But please, if you want to breathe in a squat, do it when you're locked out. If you want to breathe in a deadlift, do it at the floor or in lockout. If you want to do it in a bench, do it at the top, all right? Try and breathe as less, at least as possible during the range because you lose some of the tension, which we don't want. Uh, okay, I see okay. you're gonna... So the most criminal offense you'll see of this Mr. is breathing people... over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll call you out on it every day to Sunday. <sighs> uh, you'll see people in a squat, right? They'll go down. Quentin does this, actually, and I yell at him every <laughs> week for it, right? <laughs> Quentin will have a beautiful first rep. He'll on rack, come well. Good squat. And then he'll get here, and then he'll... <gasps> Right, right. So, tell me. Awesome, Levi. What's going to make your life more difficult? Doing a half second inhale with a giant chest and abdominal release, and then RPE 9-ing a 60% squat, like Quentin, or if you take a whole half second longer and you just finish the squat, <laughs> slow inhalation. I want to inflate my obliques, my abdominals, that doesn't require a giant ass breath of air. Look at that, my chest didn't raise at all. I'll do it again. It's very simple. Being under load for 0.2 seconds longer will not make your life more difficult than completely losing your abdominal tension. Yeah, so I think some quick ones. Uh, what is your opinion on the bounce in the squat that some people use? Trash. <laughs> I mean, if you're an Olympic lifter, sure, go okay, ahead. Okay, that's different. That's different, very. In powerlifting, um, I have a slightly different opinion than Wyatt, I think. Um, for me, it's all... <laughs> it's the same, we squat the same, buddy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, you do it in wraps, though. I'm raw, hey, listen. Buddy, I out you good. in sleeves. Which is fine. My 185 for 19, 185 for 20 in sleeves. My 1RM is higher, which is all that counts. Uh, <laughs> I'm also 40 kilos heavier, but we don't talk about it. Uh, <laughs> um, so at the bounce in the squat, I'm of the opinion, it's like the stretch reflex, right? Uh, you can get out of, the, out of the hole very fast, just don't lose position. That's, that's the main point, don't lose position. If you got some of that stretch reflex and it helps you squat more, sure, who am if I? If you can keep the tension, it's if fine. If you can keep the tension, you're fine. Good if example. you don't, stop it. If you guys, fold at heavy weights. If you guys know Nout, Nout is like a perfect master of this. If you've ah, ever watched Nout yes. squat, Nout will drop that ass down and lock that thing out like it's money. Nout's an Nout is a very remember. good example of if you're going to do this technique, uh, he does it quite well. I can't. I'm not that mobile. Yeah, like I said, Levi, <laughs> awesome. Nice day that we helped. Uh, opinion is squat bounce. Larissa, tell me your opinion. I want to know too. You probably have one. Um, okay, well, bench squat deadly. Yeah, okay, most of the time I squat too deep because I'm pretty flexible. Well, uh, well, well, but when decreasing depth, the squat feels heavier. Do you know how to fix this? Um, try and get some more hip engagement, maybe. Um, you may want to. Uh, how can I say this normally? Um, if you want to build a position, you need to spend time in that position. So, a good implement for this. Uh, you can do a pause squat or again to a tempo squat. Uh, for a pause squat, at the point where you're going to feel weak, that's where you're going to pause. Uh, 
Sounds counterintuitive, but again, you need to gain confidence in the position. Uh, you're not going to be any stronger, deeper than you are going to be higher. This is kind of just your body being used to uh, a certain way of squatting out of the hole. So say, for example, right at uh, where my hip is parallel to my knee, I feel very weak, uh, and so I collapse always very quickly in my squat. When I, <clears throat> If I would program you pause squats, I would tell you, go right here to this position where I feel weak, pause for a two count. Spend time in that position. Realize that your muscles are just as strong there as they are beneath. Uh, or you can do tempo squats, right? So if I do a five second eccentric, I'm going to feel all of the different muscular engagement as I'm going down and I'm loading. And I'm going to feel the different parts click on and the different muscles click off. Yep. So you need to spend time in the position that you want to build. It's also neural patterning, right? If you're trying to decrease your depth for the first time, it's new. You're always stronger in what you're used to. So it might feel weaker, but don't throw it out the window. Try and stick with it over time, and it might get even stronger, right? The new things are always weaker. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do them. Uh, quick tangent. Uh, when will I squat big boy weights? When you weigh like a big boy, get to that 120 plus, man. We've had this discussion again. <laughs> now this guy, this guy just casually did I did a smoke and 85% beltless squat. So yeah, yeah, yeah. he's holding out on me. Holy. Now I gave him a number by the end of the summer or else I'm gonna uh, hand Celine his dead body. I'm I agree, uh, Larissa, <laughs> I, I agree very much. Uh, Levi, thanks, I did my boss squats too deep. Well, normally uh, his, his demonstration of the boss squat could be a bit lower, but squatting without a bar in your back oh, yeah. is kind of hard. Boss squatting, I, for me personally, I do them on, on competition depth, because uh, you want to spend time in that depth to gain the confidence, right? Um, so don't go too low, don't stay too high. You can also do a double pause, high and low, um, which is also very, uh, it's, it's tough. You go out the door again. Very nuanced. Again. Um, but it works. If you're uncomfortable in lower positions, it's not something to recommend nice. for everybody. And it's also not something that you're going to do with uh, very challenging intensity. Again, you'll probably keep this between a 55% to a 75% type range. Uh, but a double squat, just for an illustration. Uh, you read my mind with that, so yeah. good job. A double spot. Say, I don't feel confident above the hole, but I also want to practice my pause in the hole, right? So as before, I'm going to come down. I'm going to pause here where I feel weak. And then there, I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to pause again, right? And that's going to make me keep control in that intermediary segment as well. So it's just a little bit of an additional challenge. Um, if you want, Levi, you can send your video to me or Wyatt, and we'll have a look at it. Uh, get back to you. Uh, we'll do two more questions if we have to. I see one more sitting from Shami again. Uh, if any one of you has another question left, uh, ask now because we're starting to run out of time. Talking, weighing as much as a big boy. What is your opinion on bulking, cutting, choosing a weight class in the first few years of lifting? Interesting question. You can start. Uh, yeah, right. So I've done a lot of world meets and I do high profile meets. Uh, I promise you that for the first five years or so of your competing, you will not be at a level where cutting weight will benefit you at all. Uh, nobody gives a crap about your 400 dots. Uh, nobody gives a crap about your 450 dots. If you're not qualifying for a world or a European level competition meet, don't cut weight. Yeah, you're pretty much just debilitating your long-term progress if you're trying to attach yourself. Nationals, I mean, it's okay. Bro, what's one more year? What, Honestly. What's, one more, what's year? one more year? Exactly. Nationals is, is a step up to maybe Euros or Worlds, um, if we're talking IPA. It's a nice, and it's a nice, it's a nice goal to set, but yeah. I, when I, mean, I started, <laughs> when I started, I had about an eight and a half times body weight total. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to cut weight and try to qualify for all these big meets. It, it ain't going to work, man. Uh, honestly, it doesn't work how you want it to. If it's ever. like, if it's like a one kilo cut, sure. If it's more That's than 5% of your body weight, don't do it. Yeah, pretty much. 5%, even like 3% is pushing it already, in my opinion. You can, you can uh, do a little bit of You sodium. can do it, you can do it, but it's, it's not optimal. Um, so just try and grow as an athlete. Don't get like super obese. Oh dear, Stan, you're, no, I can't. Well, I mean, I don't have to unless you can prove the existence. We're not so getting how? into this. We're not going into this. We're not it's getting fine. into this. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> um, so yeah, about the weight, weighing part, um, find your fit, keep training, keep eating, grow. Don't get obese, get muscular, uh, and see where you end up. 
I started at about, I think, 95 kilos body weight. I'm slightly taller. Uh, I always said one or one five class would be my fit. I almost don't so fit in a, a lot. I almost don't fit in a one twenty class anymore. I weigh one twenty three point six right now. Uh, yeah, the reason I don't stay over the one twenty plus is I don't want to be a ball and stay in the one twenty plus, which is like I have to go up to one sixty. I don't want to die at forty. So growth is going to happen no. naturally in the sport as you get stronger. You're going to build muscle mass, even though it's getting denser. It's also going to get bigger. I started yeah. 67 kilos, I'm now 86 kilos. Quick it's example as well, quick example is maybe Fabio. Fabio, yes. We all know Fabio, we all love Fabio. He's like one of the top three most wholesome guys I know in Delft. Fabio. I hope I'm in the top three as well. Hey, dude, wow. screw off. Fabio, Fabio is a national <laughs> treasure and you'll never change my mind. Facts. Anyway, Fabio uh, started off his tenure when I got to Isosteric in the 66 class. Corona hit. Uh, him and his girlfriend run the Kate Gaines page. Go give him a follow. Uh, but Fabio, They're nice. during the uh, Corona break, decided to uh, relax a little bit. Uh, he is now in the 74 class. <laughs> but <laughs> but his, what about his strength? His strength progression is uh, through really the quite roof. Well. Yeah. Uh, I, I, when I met Fabio, he was in the 66 class, and he was cutting weight like a madman, like wearing friggin'. Friggin' uh, tra trash, th cr trash bags to sweat more and stuff like that was insane. Um, performance on the meat then, not ideal. You guys, you guys now in the seventy four, strong as strong as can be. Yeah, so, now nice. he's Five not. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. not like you know thick, thick. We've done a little bit of recomp body <laughs> composition. Of course, he went up to the weight class a little bit faster than you would prefer. I would say normally you're going to ease into that. Basically, my track, and this is not for everybody, but. Every two years, I've gone up a weight class, more or less, uh, and I, after bombing out of a big meet, will never cut weight unless I have to again, and I recommend you do the same. Uh, but Fabio, for example, he's holding steady now around 75 kilos, and he's really just recomping, uh, getting better body composition, which we yep. do by having a uh, maintenance calorie type diet, enough that he's recovering, not so much that he's gaining, so not so little that he's losing. Uh, and really just consistent training that will, over time, uh, if you know Kuhn too, he's been in the 120 class for a couple of years now. Huh. Uh, if you knew Kuhn in 2019 yeah. was even in the 120 class, yeah. he was a very thick boy. Now he's actually got ab definition and quads. So uh, Slightly, slightly. Also it's getting way. better. It's very nice. Bang. Bang. Oh, they're small, man. Shit. <laughs> Anyways, that's it for today, I think. Uh, closing regards. Uh, Ramco does some closing regards. I'll give you my microphone for a sec. Uh, if you have more questions or you come up with another question later, um, feel free to ask us on Instagram and El Presidente will have the word. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, well, that's right. oh El Presidente, come, come. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, everyone, thank you for tuning in today. Um, I'm just going to stand next to you. Thank you for tuning in today. Um, please don't forget that tomorrow we still have two seminars. Um, I'm not sure who that is currently here signed up for those. But in the morning at 1030, we have a uh, weightlifting seminar, which will be given by uh, some of our weightlifting members. So check that out if you have time or if you want to, if you want to learn about weightlifting. Um, and then later on, uh, I think starting at 1, uh, we're going to... Uh, Oh, 10.30 in the morning, by the way. Uh, starting at 1 p.m., so like 13 hours, uh, we're going to have a powerlifting in-depth seminar, which is going to be um, about programming. These guys are distracting me. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so that's going to be that's going to be in-depth. That's going to be given by uh, William... William von der Streich. All right. Listen, this right here is the tallest, uh, the tallest vegan yeah. bodybuilder at Isosherk. Yeah, so, you are. Look. Okay, yeah. I am. Yeah, and you even got the worst angle. Damn. Anyway. What do you mean? What's that supposed to mean? All right. Well, that said, uh, thank you guys for tuning in, and probably, possibly, hopefully, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>